I think that starts with Jalen Hurts, uh, and absolutely, I, I do. I do think you know that's maybe the strength, maybe the biggest strength of Jalen Hurts. All right, Eagle time. Welcome back in, everybody. Sports Day, Jacob Sports YouTube Network, Barrett Brooks, Derek Gunn. Rob Ellis, we're joined by our colleague, and you can see him each and every day right here at Jacob Sports Network, 8 to 10, with our guy Jody Mack. That's John McMullen, who covers the birds, in addition to a show that he does with Jody for jacobsports.com, which I love. I was all over this weekend and today. Jay Mack, what's going on, my man? <clears throat> What's going on, guys? The A team. I'm glad man. to be with the A team. What's going on, my brother? My man, my man. So, John, a lot, a lot to get to here, right? Because I know you spent a lot of time down there, you know, the past week or so with OTAs as they continue. Let's start with the most generic way we, we I can ask this. What's kind of jumped out at you, whether it's good, bad, and different from what you were the access, which is limited, mind you, that you've that you've been able to get the last week or so. Uh, mainly the off the field stuff because they don't do much on the field, to be honest, this time of year. And we're scaled back to seven on sevens and 50 minutes on the practice field. So you can't learn a lot from that. But what we did know, and, you know, last year, uh, Nick Sirianni gave the play calling to Shane Steichen. I think that was a little bit of an underreported thing. Now Shane confirmed that's going to be the way they go forward and he's going to be the offensive play caller. And then you have the 30-person, 30, 30, think about that, guys, 30-person reshuffling of the front office, 19 promotions, wow. 11 outside hires, 30 different changes. And, I, you know, some of that, it, 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 you know, the two assistant GMs, Alec Hallaby and John Ferrari, are essentially – having the same job and, and getting a, a, a bigger title, but still it, it's, it was a power vacuum and, you know, it was filled a little bit more by guess who, Howie Roseman, at least on the scouting side. Well, John, so not everybody is familiar with these guys. I know they, they maybe have heard the names, you know, Ferrari and Halleck be floated out there, but Tell us what you know about these two and what exactly their roles are going to be for the organization or, or what they were, and maybe they're in a different title now, but what, exactly what are they going to be doing? Well, Alex probably a little bit better known because he's the analytics guy and, you know, everybody remembers, maybe butted some heads when Doug Peterson was here, the scouting staff in the analytics uh, department uh, seemed to be cleaned up a little bit more under Andy Weidel, who seemed a little bit more open-minded to the analytics part of it. Um, John Ferrari's more of the, what I would call the the nuts and bolts guy. You, you may have heard uh, Nick Sirianni mention him a couple times. He was sort of the, the go between, uh, between football ops and the scouting staff and the league itself when it came to compliance issues and rule issues. And the, the Eagles are, are usually ahead of the curve when it comes to stuff like that. Um, you know, winning outside the margins is what they call it. So any little advantage they can get. And John Ferrari is really good at stuff like that. Um, but it is strange. You know, most of the league, when you talk about assistant GM or even GM, to be honest, it's changing a little bit with – uh, Andrew Berry, who was here, and Quesio Dopa Menson, Minnesota, is a Cherry Hill native. Um, more come from the analytics or finance background. So there's a little bit of a shift, but typically still in this league, when you talk about GMs or assistant GMs, it's usually on the scouting side. It's usually from the scouting side. And the Eagles, their top three people in this organization now are all from the football ops side, mm -hmm. not the scouting side. And guys, they didn't replace Andy Weidel. They do mm -hmm. not have a vice president of player personnel. They're hoping one of these guys, um, whether it's Brandon Hunt, who was brought in from Pittsburgh, or, or, or Chuck Walls, who was brought in from Cleveland, sort of grows into the job. Might be Alan Wolking, who got a promotion and was here. 
They're hoping they grow into that job. But right now, there is no Andy Weidel in this team scouting stat. Wow. Well, you know what, John? A lot of times moves are made like this after a draft. Um, gives teams leeways to to thoroughly scour the countryside to find what they hope will be that right guy. Um, I don't think it has you know a high impact right now on the Eagles not having an Andy Weidel in the organization, but usually by the regular season, guys like to hit the ground running because that's when they start scouting for next year as well. But how surprised did you? <clears throat> we, we, we're, we're accustomed to seeing changes made in front offices year in, year out. But to this degree, I mean, this could really upset the apple cart in terms of what the Eagles have done over the last terms year of continuity and fluidity. Yeah, I mean, I go back to 2016 when when Jeffrey Lurie uh, brought Howie Roseman back. Not back, he was in the building, but brought him back from exile, as I call it, from the, from the business and uh, the organization. And he made a big deal out of we have to hire a personnel guy and these yeah. and, and they're going to have to work together. And I remember when they brought in Joe Douglas, Jeffrey said something to the, you know, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, this is this is our biggest hire of the year. That's how yeah. important yeah. this hire was. So what changed from 2017 to now to where you don't feel the need uh, to bring in somebody at the top of the scouting staff who's clearly ha- on the same footing as what Alec Alibi and John Ferrari are. Yeah. I don't know what's changed in that circumstance other than how we, you know, sort of believing, and we'll use Jalen Rager and J.J. Ortega Whiteside as, as an example here, how he wanted uh, uh, Justin Jefferson. And he sort of uh, deferred to the coaching staff. Uh, in least, at least that's the claim. Um, in the case of J.J. Ortega Whiteside, he wanted Paris Campbell, and he kind of deferred to other people in the organization. And from his mentality, it's like, okay, my name's on the pick, so I might as well pick who I want. And then at least, good or bad, um, it'll actually be – uh, what he wants, and that's what I think is going on. And anytime there's a vacuum, people are going to seek to fill it, and 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 he filled it with himself. And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think Howie's had a great off season. Um, I know they didn't want to uh, jump people. I I would think of of the people they currently have in the organization, Brandon Hunt is probably the one most ready to be a vice president of player personnel. Uh, But he'd be coming in from Pittsburgh and he'd be jumping over a guy like Alan Wall King, who's been here for many years and been very loyal to the organization. So the Eagles were very cognizant of not bringing in an outside voice. Uh, to immediately jump into that position, and they want somebody to grow into it. We'll see who that somebody is, you know. But when Howie gets a position of power, he's generally not going to give it up. John, wow. anything to be made of the players who aren't at OTAs? They're voluntary, just to be clear about that. Um, you know, I, I some of the names I, I looked at, some of the veteran guys – uh, Kelsey Lane, uh, Mylotta, Fletcher Cox, uh, Reddick, et cetera. There's no regger there either. Anything to be made of any of that? No, I, I think it's always a circumstance. Brett Toth was getting married, so I think a lot of the offensive linemen wanted to get out on Friday for that, um, and that might have explained some of that. Jalen Rager's dealing with some serious off-the-field issues. Is you know Jeff Gladney uh, yep. tragically passed. He's very close to him. I know he had uh, services over the past couple of days. So it's generally these things where guys are in and out and, and they'll excuse them. Um, and l- last Friday was the open day for reporters. So, I mean, a lot of guys probably just wanted to get out for the weekend. And um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it as, as players. The one guy, Pletcher, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, 
I put an asterisk next next to him because Fletcher is typically one of those guys that talks to us all the time. He's one of the go-to guys. And since everything went down with his contract, um, he has not spoken to the media at all. So this goes back to before OTAs. They were giving us a group of players uh, once a week. Fletcher still hasn't spoken about it. And, you know, maybe he's a little bit unhappy that he had to rework his deal. Uh, we'll see. So I just put that out there. I, I, you know, I don't think he's still getting fourteen million dollars. So he's still re-signed with the organization. He could should be thrilled to talk to out. anybody, John. He should be doing <laughs> yeah. that clips with the way that he played yeah. last year. Yeah. So I, but it's it's strange that he hasn't talked to us by this point. Is hey, is all I would say. Hey, John, what do you think about the way the um, the PR staff is handling you guys from a media perspective? I mean, uh, the NFL opened up the locker room, the field, stuff like that. But they do so with certain limitations on it as well. Um, how do you feel about the access slash limited access that you guys have once again out there? Yeah, it's not great. I mean, let's yeah. be honest, Eric. You'd like the locker room. I hope it's going to be open by the yeah. regular season. We'll see. Um, 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 you know, I think training camp's a little bit easier because hopefully we'll be able to – to grab guys as they're coming off the field. You don't really have to open the locker room, but once the regular season starts, um, it would be nice and other teams have done it, but I do think the league is going to leave it up to uh, each individual organization. And I don't think the Eagles mind, let's put it that way, that we don't have access to the locker mm -hmm. room. Uh, I don't, you know, they do the best they can in these circumstances. Um, but it's not good for anybody. It, and I know fans are probably, you know, they don't want to hear reporters complain, and I understand that. But it affects the information fans get as well. So I, I do think it's an important part of the game. The league understands it. We'll see how much the Eagles understand it. As far yeah. as OTAs, Look, they only have six OTA practices, but, you know, we only have access. We had access on Friday. We'll have access one day this week. It'll either come tomorrow or Wednesday. I don't like that. I mean, there's no no reason the Eagles couldn't open up each practice for 10, 15 minutes at least for the media to at least watch individual <clears throat> drills, sort of like a regular season practice. But it All is right. what it is, and 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 – Every team is scaling back uh, yep. media yep. access, and it's probably not a good thing. No, I um, <clears throat> I, I'm 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 gonna go from the players now. You know, I mean, I let you guys talk all about front office and all that. No, in fact, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna tell you guys this: Brandon Hunt is a really good friend of mine. In fact, I'm gonna get him on the show as soon as I see him. Uh, uh, you know, I'll probably see him on Wednesday if he's there on Wednesday. I'll have to connect with him because I when I was with the Steelers, he had just got there. And he All was right. just a guy. I'm talking about he was low man on the totem pole. So he worked his way up with the muscle. You know what I'm saying? Real sharp dude. Really good friend of mine, man. So right. I'll get him. But um, Derek's going to hold you to that. Oh, no question. I know he always Wait, does. Let me, let me let's see. one four <laughs> one fourteen <laughs> p.m. Watch. Um, Watch Monday. what I tell you. Watch All what right. I tell you. Right. Watch what I tell you. But uh, right. um, got it. John, I, I I was out with the guys, you know. I was in that charity basketball, I mean, uh, softball game the other day. AJ um, Brown's a ringer, man. That's oh, a Padres draft pick. No <laughs> question, man. No question. He showed it. He showed it. He, in fact, he won the home run contest. Uh, he actually dethroned um, uh, uh, what's his name from uh, from Dallas, uh, Micah Parsons. Parsons. Micah Parsons. Parsons. Yeah. So yeah, but um, you know, tell you the truth, that's the tightest group I've seen as far as a locker room. You know, just from guys being outside of the locker room that I've seen in a long time, man. There's very few and far between do you get guys to come and play and stuff like that when you're not getting paid. And these guys came uh, to help out, you know, Devontae Smith and the camaraderie and the closeness that you got. This is this is this is upwards right right around that 2017 team that I see the closeness, 2017, 2018. Do you get that feeling or do you, do you see it when you were at practice? Because it was very evident, you know, even though I talked to guys that weren't even, that, even the guys that the way they talk about guys who weren't even there, you could tell the closeness and how close those guys were. 
even at this this baseball game, the softball game. Yeah, I mean, I I think that starts with Jalen Hurts, uh, and absolutely, I, I do I do think you know that's maybe the strength, maybe the biggest strength of Jalen Hurts. I I've still have yet to meet the guy who doesn't like Jalen Hurts, and it it's, um, you know, he goes out of his way. I think that's the most impressive thing about Jalen is you know when the Eagles bring somebody in. You know, whether they draft him, whether they trade for A.J. Brown, for instance. And and he's obviously a little bit different because he's so close to Jalen off the field. But no matter who it is, um, first guy who texts him is Jalen Hurts. He goes out of his way to get their number, to find them, to welcome them to Philadelphia. Um, he goes in the locker room. This time of year, there's there's 90 players, as, as you know, Barrett. So. Typically, there's a former quarterback in this town that shall remain nameless, wasn't going to go around and introduce himself to the 90th guy on this roster. Jalen Hurts will, and he tries to engage everybody, and he understands you know, his, his sort of platform on this team and who he is as the on-field leader, and he tries to uh, involve everybody. He tries to bring them in under the umbrella. And for a quarterback, a lot of quarterbacks, you know, forget about, um, uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. Look, that guy's MVP, MVP, probably going to win another MVP. Trust me on Aaron Rodgers. He's not going out of his way to contact everybody in Green Bay. Now, when you're that good, it really doesn't matter. But I do think it's one of those outside the margins things people don't think about when you talk about chemistry, camaraderie. Um, I think it all starts with Jalen Hurts. And then you got guys on the on on the defensive side of the ball as well. I mean, D Gunn knows there's not a better person in the history of the NFL than Brandon Graham when it comes to engaging people. Um Darius Slay is an unbelievable teammate for all oh, no the, question. Yes, you could tell the, that. Yes. The, the joking and all the stuff. I mean, he just he wants to help the young corners, the young receivers. He's taken Devonte Smith under his wing as a cornerback to try to show him as one of the best cornerbacks in the, in the NFL how to be a great receiver in this league. So they they built up. They have leaders, and we all know about Jason Kelsey, and on and on and on. They have these leaders that that you know are cognizant of what it means to build a strong locker room. John, one of the things you wrote about uh, the last couple of days was Brandon <clears throat> Graham really thinks Derek Barnett is due for a good year. And you know, he's, he's been through <laughs> Derek, Why yeah, have, Derek? Derek's reaction. So he's been through five years, John, I can't even get through well, the question. Good so he's, teammate. Good yeah, teammate. Yeah. But, uh, right. No, and, and Brandon's a great teammate, but yeah. I mean, you talk about a guy who's had 21 and a half sacks in, in, in whatever it's been five years since they drafted him prior to 17. Other than Brandon's the greatest guy in the world, which we all agree with. Why should any of us believe that this is going to be the year for him? Well, I, you know, look, I, I don't even see where where there's going to be playing time to where it can be the year for him. But here's how I describe Derek Barnett. Derek Barnett's all about expectations as the former 14th overall pick in the draft, right? <clears throat> He's he if if he were a third round pick and he was the fourth rotational end, you'd say that's pretty stinking good. But he's not. He's always going to have that pedigree. Uh, around his neck, right? He's the number 14 overall pick. He broke all of Reggie White's sack records at Tennessee. Yada, yada, yada. Lane Johnson said he's got the best bend he's seen since Von Miller. All this stuff over the years, over the – and people were expecting this great pass rusher. And he Reggie never, White's sack record. Yep. Yeah. All, all of Reggie's sack records at Tennessee, but never developed into it. So I think that's what everyone says. And when you snicker and say, and I don't blame you, when you snicker and say, all right, Derek Barnett's not this, you're right. But as a fourth defensive end, I'd like to see the, the team in the NFL that is a better fourth defensive end than Derek Barnett. I really would. 
John, the reason I snicker is because when Rob was asking you the question, the first thing that came to mind is until I see him have more sacks than penalties, I'm sorry. I, I can't get on board with Derek Barnett. Derek Barnett has a lot of talent. I equate Barnett to similar to Brandon Graham's situation. Brandon Graham yeah, struggled very early, very struggled in his career, had the injury bug, didn't live up to being a high first round draft pick. And then all of a sudden the light switch went on. The Eagles, the Eagles stood their ground. They heard the criticism. They, they, they deflected all the bullets towards Brandon Graham. And lo and behold, now Brandon Graham can write his own ticket in the city of Philadelphia based off of one play, one play. He, he strip sacked the evil empire. Now all of a sudden, Brandon Graham is a national treasure in the city of Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm hoping and praying that Derek Barnett. Now the Eagles re-upped him for what two more years, and people are already like, "Oh my God, are you kidding me? Why would you do this?" So I'm going to defer to the Eagles in this regard. <clears throat> we tried to get Brandon Graham out of town early in his career. Lo and behold, now he's the Pie Piper of Philadelphia. I don't know if Derek Barnett will ever elevate his status to that. I'm just hoping, as I said in my initial statement, that we can see Derek Barnett play a season where he has more sacks than penalties. That's all I want. Um, well, we'll see if it happens, but I, I will mm -hmm. say this: when you say two, the, the contract is really one year for five and a right. half million, and, and right. the Eagles can get out of it. So, right. um, you know, it's nice depth. So you hope Hassan Reddick stays healthy, Josh Sweat stays healthy, uh, Brandon stays healthy. And then, you know, if, if, if Derek Barnett ends up being that fourth pass rusher, he's not going to get the opportunity. You know, he mm -hmm. might have three sacks and two penalties. Hopefully he can reach your threshold, d -Gun. But <laughs> he's not going to have the opportunity to, to put together big numbers because he's not going to be playing that much. Now, if, if somebody gets hurt and you need them, that's when it really comes into play. And people are going to be really focused on Derek Barnett. Um, depends where it is. Look, if he's your starting defensive end, starting right defensive end, you're probably not good enough. If he's your fourth rotational end, that's that's really good depth. So it depends. As always, defaulting to the fact that he was a first round pick, it's always going to be a disappointment. All right, well, let me give you two. Let me throw this out there, Barry. Two things before you ask your question. So one, the Eagles will have one open practice this year. It's Sunday, August 7th at 7 p.m. Lincoln Financial Field. Tickets are 10 bucks. Parking is free. So there's only one this year. Uh, training camp starts on July 26th, just an FYI. Barrett, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, when, when, you, when you say he's not going to play a lot this year as far as reps, are you saying that because of schematically or as far as um, he's, he's the fourth guy on the totem pole? He said that he's the fourth guy <clears throat> on the totem pole. So, you know, there's just a limited number of reps that's going to be available. If guys stay healthy. You know, I'm trying to figure out, look, what do you do in the NASCAR package? So the, the, the so-called pass rushing package, if you're Jonathan Gannon and it's third and 13, all right, yep. I'm going to have Reddick on the field. I'm going to have sweat on the field. Then it comes down. Do you want to kick Brandon Graham inside? Do you want Fletcher out there? Do you want Javon out there? That's five guys right there. And you only need four in that particular package. So there's pretty good depth on, on the offensive and defensive lines of this team. And that's typically been the strength of the Eagles. It's the strength again, at least on paper. And you, when you go with a, a, a 50 front, you know, when you have um, both guards covered and, and the center covered, then you might have a defensive end on the outside and then you have – uh, Reddick on the outside, it's still he's an odd man out for too deep then because, you know, you got to have a linebacker rush in on one side and then you might have a big um, defensive end on the other side. And there again, you have Sweat instead of him or, you yeah. know, I mean, so it's just... And that's where Big Jordan comes into it because... Exactly. You know, now he's the nose, that, yeah. When they use that 50 front, it's going to be Jordan Davis playing zero yeah. or one. And, you know, then they're going to have what, what Gannon calls overhang players, and that's going to yep. be Reddick and Sweat. Um, and then, you know. Both Jay Johnson Bond's, kids. Yeah, Jay Bond's going to probably play three technique and maybe Fletcher at four I or five. That's pretty stinking good. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Stinking. There's yeah. a lot of depth there, that's for sure. Yeah. John, let me ask you how I, – I understand it's not – 
the real deal and pads and all that and tackling down to the, to the ground and all that. But how has Hertz looked? How are his connections with his receivers from what you've seen? Well, one day, 50 minutes, but he was really uh, sharp uh, seven on sevens. Now, if, you know, Sam Bradford would have a gold jacket if seven on sevens matter. <laughs> so, you know, they're designed to, uh, they're designed for the offense and the right. passing game to succeed. But Jalen looked really sharp. And, you know, we talk about chemistry and him and AJ are, are so close off the field. But the chemistry with Devontae Smith was better on mm -hmm. the field. Uh, and he was the one who was getting deep and getting the deep balls. And, yeah, it looked good. And and we'll see if it, it's consistent. And, and because, look, this team wants to throw the ball. You don't bring in – AJ Brown for a hundred million dollars and say, Hey, we're going to be a run first team again. They want to utilize AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard. And it's going to be very similar to last season in the fact that they were very pass heavy and unsuccessfully. So early before they shifted gears, they want to be pass heavy and they want to utilize all these receivers and it's up to Jalen Hurts, and we're going to see. We're going to see where he is. In talking to those guys, I was talking to um, uh, Dallas Goddard, man, on the offensive side of the ball, just, just how things are going to open up for him. And I think they truly realize how special they can be. But the thing, the thing between them looking at, at them being a – uh, what do you call it? the the greatest or what what was that called show on um, turf greatest show on turf greatest show on turf or whatever you want to call it, um, they say that they're ready they're they're ready to put the work in they're putting the work in they're they're doing everything they need to do and that kind of caught me you know they said they were ready to work that's how they let that's how they started the conversation up man I'm I'm just ready to work man I mean, we could be pretty good but we're gonna put this work in well and I, I got to say and they do work hard but. Most of the work they're doing, Barrett, is in the stinking classroom because right. they're never on right. the field. Right. Um, Does that concern you, John? The, the the lack of you know camps also. They didn't have a lot of injuries last year, but the the camp is not as arduous as it maybe has been in the past. The OTAs well, are less than they even have to do. Well, I'll say this, Rob. There's two teams who don't have a mandatory mini camp: the Eagles and the Cincinnati Bengals. And the Bengals at least have a reason. They're coming off the longest season in NFL history, right? They went to the Super Bowl. First seventeen game season. Um, I'm 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 more of an old school guy, but I realize things change. It's never going to be like the way it was, like when Barrett had to practice and 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 two a days and all that kind of stuff. So the Eagles have been um, ahead of the curve for the most part. I do think that's one of the positives of having a younger coach who's open minded to this mm -hmm. stuff because. You know, some of these old school coaches go, well, I want to practice. I want to be up. Well, you're not allowed to by the CBA. But the Eagles are taking it to an extreme. They're not utilizing the time they do have on the field, at least, because you could have 13 offseason practices. They're at six, guys. Six. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Is it going to hurt the veteran guys? No. It's not going to hurt the veteran. It's not going to hurt the Kelsey's and the Grams of the world. Who cares? But when it comes to like 45 through 90 on the roster and you're trying to develop these younger players, I don't see how it helps them. I will say that. So, so John, who's your odds on favorite to emerge as the number two tight end behind Goddard as we sit here today? Um, if I had to bet, I'd bet on Grant Calcaterra, uh, mm. the rookie six-round pick. And I, I think it'll be sort of Jack Stoll will be the blocker and, and Grant will be more the receiver. You know, Tyree Jackson was on the field. It was interesting. I, I got to see him, but he had a big, big brace on his right leg. And mm. he tore his ACL in week 18. So that's a nine-month injury, which would be right around September. Um, so we're not going to see him for a while. How dare week. you not say Jay Jaw? I dare you. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, John. Come on, John. You better than that. <laughs> yeah. He he did gain some weight. I think the Eagles listed him at 237. But 
that's a tough transition to make. Um, that is a concern because, you know, Dallas Goddard's great. We all know he's an emerging star, but they don't have much behind Dallas Goddard yeah, at tight end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I, I want to hit last one. I want to hit you with John. You touched on it early, the Steichen thing. And, you know, it wasn't like it was new. He did take over last year, but it, you're right. It was downplayed a little bit or just maybe not played up enough, whatever. Um, what's your sense of that? Do you like the fact that Sirianni's taking more of the delegation role? He can, you know, look at his defense, look at his special teams, address a player or a coach during a game rather than having to be locked in on every little single thing. How do you view it? Yeah, I mean, I tell Jody this all the time. I love CEO coaches. I'd rather have a CEO coach than a play caller. Because to me, and I go back to Sean McVay, I say this all the time. If you go back, and Sean's obviously the flavor of not the month, the years, mm -hmm. anybody who's... Just got even, married, by the way. Uh, yeah, any, any, anybody who's ever had a cup of coffee with Sean McVay is going to get a head coaching interview in this league. So, you know, <laughs> people like Sean McVay. If you go back to when he was a rookie coach with the Rams, um, he wouldn't even pay attention when when the defense was on the field. He would go mm -hmm. sit down with Jared Goff. Wade Phillips would handle the defense at the time. He wouldn't even pay attention. And I'm like, he's just a glorified, you know, offensive coordinator with the title of head coach. And most of the league, to be honest, is run that way. And where you have – in essence, dueling head coaches, but one has the designation. Uh, it was here this way with Doug Peterson and Jim Schwartz. Doug didn't do anything with the defense. So I'd like CEO coaches. Now, people point to Jason Garrett. You know, he was not a good CEO coach. The, the hand clapper, I've gotten a lot of that when I say this. Um, but remember, Jerry Jones took play calling away from, from Jason Garrett. So he essentially, you know, uh, uh, hamstrung him himself. To my knowledge, uh, nobody took play calling away from Nick Sirianni. Mm -hmm. If somebody did, I'd have a big problem with this. The fact that he did it himself because he wants a, an overview of his entire team. I, I love, I love that thought process. But I will say the way the NFL is run, it's it's a gutsy move by Sirianni because he got this job because he was an offensive guy. He was an offensive play caller. He was brought in here to call the plays and barely through midway through his first season, he said, you know what? I'm going to shift things around. So if things go in a negative direction, it could really hurt Nick. Um, but I, I love it. I, I think it's the right thing to do. And I want him involved in all aspects. If I were an owner, um, I just prefer it. I just think that's the way to do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I like the fact that he's confident enough of him, in himself that he's willing to give things. I, I know that sounds strange, but he, he's got enough security exactly in, in the way yeah. that he in his beliefs that he's willing to give those things up. It doesn't have to be a control freak which I think, like you said, could blind you to certain things. That's where I give him a lot of props uh, in general. I thought he handled himself well in both of those capacities last year. John, good stuff, man. And, and I'm loving your work on jacobsports.com, J-A-K-I-B, jacobsports.com, our new website. And, of course, with Jody every morning, every uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 10, Birds 365. Good stuff, John. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, guys. Always appreciate uh, it, brother. Yep. You got it. Yeah, Jay, Jay Mackey. Again, guys, check out the site, man. It's really, really good. There's all kinds of stories on there, Eagle stories, and you can link up to any of the shows, and all of our past stuff is there as well. You go to YouTube and, and, and get our past interviews and past shows too, but it's there as well. So good stuff. Hey.